Welcome, everybody, to TED Talks Ball. I've got a, a special guest, Tom Spencer. This is sort of a new uh, foray for me, doing a recorded show that we will later post to YouTube. So I don't know if it's morning or night uh, when we're posting this, but good day anyway. And uh, please welcome Tom Spencer. Uh, you may know him uh, as uh, one of CBS's top analysts. He works with Jim Nance for golf and for football. So a lot of times when you hear Jim Nance saying a statistic or something really interesting about a player or a golfer, uh, a lot of times that's Tom telling him, telling him, giving him that information. So this is a, a great guy, a childhood friend of mine from growing up on the Mid Peninsula, and uh, really excited to introduce him here today. And Tom. Let everybody know what I may have missed or what you've got going on, anything like that coming up. Wow, Ted. Well, it's a flattering uh, introduction. I appreciate it, my man. Uh, yeah, I mean, Jim, as you can well imagine, to, to reach the point in his career where, where he is, he doesn't need a lot of help, right? So uh, the way he likes to phrase it is we're – and it's not only myself. There's a whole team of people involved, but – you're exchanging concepts. And in the end, you know, it'd be like if, if, if you and I had a conversation uh, before your broadcast and then, you know, you sort of listened and sort of thought, well, I mean, that's, that's one way to look at it, but I've got my own way to, to talk about something. So you ultimately have the final say uh, what goes on the air and what doesn't. And, and that's what, you know, Jim has to decide. Uh, a lot of times it's very spontaneous and spur of the moment. And, and so in, in one sense, you have to have a lot of trust in the people around you that the information, one, they're giving you is factually correct. And secondly, does it work in this particular moment of a broadcast? Or is it something we might save for down the line or just doesn't work at all? So that's part of the genius of people like Jim and Al Michaels and Mike Tirico and other uh, you know, great broadcasters who are on the air right now is they can siphon through a lot of information on the air in real time and, and figure out what makes sense and what doesn't. And then and then if you give them something mundane, actually make it sound like really special and when it leaves when it leaves their lips. So uh, it's a fun job, as you can well imagine. I can only imagine. And. I would love to hear a little bit more, Tom, about how you got that job and how you got started. Um, you know, um, I'm just sort of getting started in this podcasting, YouTube channel, streaming world. I've done some articles and whatnot. And I'd love to hear more about how you got your first start and then how you got your chance to work for CBS and ultimately to work with Jim Nance. And I guess Tony Romo, too, right? You're working with them now as well, too. Yeah, we're, we're closely with Tony. We're having a great time. Uh, started that, that team in 2017. Uh, prior to that, I worked with Phil Sims, which, as you would probably uh, appreciate, is kind of ironic because when we were growing up, you know, the Niners and the New York Giants were not exactly best of friends. And, you know, we can all remember 49er fans, you know, Phil and Ronnie Lott going nose to nose at Candlestick. Uh, some amazing games uh, that those uh, teams played in the 80s and 90s, but got to work with Phil, who's you know fantastic. Um, really, really appreciate my friendship with him. And then when Phil went into the studio, Tony came out, uh, you know, after he'd retired from the NFL. And of course, he's been a meteoric rise ever since. But, you know, going back to your original uh, question, for me, just like you, you know, growing up on the peninsula, it was all about Bay Area sports. And I was as big a 49er, even Raiders, you know, Giants, A's, Warriors, whatever, Stanford, Cal. I mean, we, we followed it all. And uh, the one thing that I kind of gravitated towards individually was, was golf. And I remember in high school, actually, a couple times, um, uh, if my parents heard this, they'd probably uh, not be too pleased, but I skipped a couple days of school <laughs> Normally you do that to get yourself in some trouble, but I was actually going to some golf exhibitions in the Bay Area that uh, tour pros were competing in. And um, so I kind of had the golf bug and then I would go down to the AT&T at Pebble Beach and spectate there. I caddied a few times in the tournament. So I, I kind of knew a little bit the ins and outs of, of the pro golf scene, at least in Northern California. And then when I went to college, um, so the event that was just held last week, Ted, down in Los Angeles, the Genesis Invitational, 
at Riviera Country Club. That wasn't too far from where I went to school. So my freshman year, I, I just did kind of what I was doing. I went out to the golf tournament and I was a Fred Couples fan and I was following him around the course on a Sunday and CBS at the time, it's different now. Like you will not go off the air until, until a golf tournament is a hundred percent finished. But back in the late eighties, early nineties, like if you hit what's the magic hour in network television is usually six o'clock Eastern time and which would be three o'clock Pacific. So at three o'clock Pacific, this particular year was a rain delay and the leaders were on like the fifth hole. So CBS went off the air. So I was walking up the 17th hole at Riviera and Jim Nance came out of the tower on the 15th hole, which is adjacent to it. And I, not really my style, but I saw him there and, and I walked up to him and I knew that he and Fred Couples had a history because they had gone to college together and played on the golf team at the University of Houston. And Fred had actually two weeks earlier on Super Bowl Sunday kind of given away a tournament in Phoenix um, by hitting it in the water in a playoff. So I went up to Nance and said, hey, tough break for your friend a couple weeks ago. And that's basically started a conversation that lasted about 30 minutes. <laughs> and I shook his hand and, and said goodbye. And it's somewhere in there, I guess I had you know, mentioned where I was going to school and what I was doing. So subsequent to that, that same summer, I was back in New York visiting a college friend. And I talked him into taking me out to the Westchester Golf Tournament. And the same scenario happened again. Nance is coming out of a tower. And I walk up to him with my friend Josh. I said, you know, Mr. Nance, hi, my name's uh, Tom Spencer. And before I could even extend my hand and get the words out, he's like, Tommy Spencer, how's, how's school going? How's the golf team? How's uh, your communication studies? I was like, this guy actually remembers my name and where I go to school. So to say that this whole thing evolved out of two conversations would be a little bit of an understatement, but that's essentially how it started. Just Nance being nice to me and leaving a, a great impression on me where I had the confidence to go back up to him later on and reintroduce myself. And Ted, as you can well imagine, now that I've been around him for many, many years, he does this a lot with a lot of people. But at the time I felt pretty special. <laughs> And uh, one thing led to another, and it's been a great honor for me to work with them at CBS since really 1995. That's incredible. And then, so before 95, though, you were KNBR here in the Bay Area, local radio station. Yes. Is that how you got your first, first start? And Well, and also, I want to not move away from your golfing yet, too, because you were a hell of a golfer. I mean, I don't think you really talked about that, but you were a great golfer. I think you were near scratch. Didn't you almost qualify for a tournament one year at Paso Tiempo or something like that, if I'm recalling correctly? <laughs> well, uh, thanks for bringing that up. I, I don't know if I was a great golfer, but I did play a lot. Uh, and at Burlingame High School, I was I was a halfway decent player. And then, you know, my decision, which was not a hard one, but you're 18, 19 years old. And I think one of the benefits to going to these PGA Tour events and actually knowing a few pros – that, that were from our area, like Nathaniel Crosby, who uh, he went and played on the European tour after winning the U.S. Amateur at Olympic Club. Dennis Trixler from San Mateo. These are, you know, guys that were playing golf on the peninsula and then trying to compete on the PGA Tour, the European Tour. And it, it, even with their immense talent, it was a little bit of a struggle for them. So knowing that I wasn't as good as, as they are, I had no chance to be a tour pro. So I figured, you know, why go to college and try to play golf for four years? In retrospect, you know, it would have been nice maybe to keep your game sharp. But um, I chose to go to a bigger school and then walk on to the team. And, you know, that, that's a tough thing to do when they're giving away scholarships and, and you're going to, a, you know, a top 10 type program. So I did keep my game pretty sharp after college and, and still play a lot today. And I think the tournament you might be referring to is the uh, U S open has qualifying stages and they start at the local level. So being from the peninsula, you choose a site that's in the Northern California region that happened to be in Santa Cruz, California at Pasta Tiempo, great public golf course. And then if you happen to advance beyond that, and believe me, there were many years where I did not advance beyond local qualifying, but in 2008, I did, which got me to the sectionals, which is more of a national 
regional thing where you go to a site, for instance, Columbus, Ohio is where I ended up. And in wow. theory, if you make it through 36 holes there, you're in the U.S. Open, which is easier said than done. But I did have a good round of Pasa Tiempo. I think I shot 69 and then made it to Columbus and, and shot, you know, like 78, 72. And, uh, you know, was well back in the pack. In fact, the guy that was the low, that was the medalist that day was his name's Peter Tom Sula. And he went to Cal and he had never seen the golf course that we were playing that day. He just showed up from a, a web.com event the day before in Chicago. And I think I, I was 22 shots worse than he was. So <laughs> that gives you a little bit of an idea over 36 holes, the difference between a decent amateur player and, and even like a, a middle of the road tour pro. Got it. Got it. Now, Tom Sula, he's not related to Jim Tom Sula at all. No, no, no relation and doesn't have the yeah. energy that, that coach has either. I don't think. <laughs> oh boy. He was something else. No, no, yeah. no, no, no. What a great D line coach he was. Um, so where was the U S open ultimately held that, that year? Uh, Torrey Pines in San Diego, so which okay. is the year that the Tiger Woods won on a broken leg. So, uh, oh my God! I actually went to the U.S. I remember saying at the time, um, Ted, that if I even if I don't qualify for the U.S. Open, I can still go on my media credentials. So I did go for a couple <laughs> days that week, and, and Tiger, of course, had a, had a magic uh, magic win there. Yeah, that's like uh, when somebody says we'll be back, like Eagles fans saying, "Oh, we'll be back in the Super Bowl." And I said, not without a ticket, kind of same thing, not without a media credential. Love it. <laughs> um, so I guess that's a little bit of a segue. But before we jump into Super Bowl, um, I'd love to just make sure we've covered everything about like what it's like working with Jim Nance and Tony Romo. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I just realized that I need to uh, update that spelling there quickly. But uh, if you if there is there more that you wanted to talk about about that experience uh, sure. or did you feel like we covered that already um, well I, what I could do Ted is, is is give your viewers maybe some insight into what goes into a let's call it a high level NFL broadcast so we're the A team for CBS obviously Fox has their A team you've got you know Monday night football you've got Amazon so you've got really four let's call it main level NFL broadcast. Now, not to say that the B team at Fox and CBS and, and other teams as you, as you work your way down the ladder aren't as good. They just don't have necessarily all the bells and whistles. They don't have the, the marquee broadcasters every time. They don't get the marquee games. The one thing that we have that's different from other crews is you're guaranteed to get the best game on CBS every Sunday. Now it might be a one o'clock regional game, but you're still going to get probably two really good teams, even though it might go to only 30% of the country. Conversely, you're, uh, if you have a double header game, say with involving the Dallas Cowboys, for instance, it might go to a hundred percent of the country. So, you know, there's a lot of eyeballs involved, but basically to get ready for a show on a Sunday, you know, it, it really starts Monday afternoon, Monday evening, Tuesday morning, when you start receiving emails from the teams that you're about to cover. And basically every day of that week, Ted, which you would love is getting access to every article that's being written on both teams. And by the way, every team around the league, if you want to follow that up until game time. So literally like an hour or two before your broadcast on Sunday, you're still getting emails from PR staffs with like the Sunday articles from that morning. Um, then we travel. So I live on the East coast now, actually, uh, outside of Philadelphia. So I do have a little bit of a pulse on, on the Eagle situation, but we travel Thursday, Friday, sometimes as late as Saturday morning. And then you meet face to face with both teams. Um, typically the, the home team, you would meet them at, on a Friday at their home complex. Saturday, you would meet with the visiting team at their hotel. Now COVID, as you can well imagine, really changed things dramatically where if we were traveling, we were kind of quarantining in our hotel rooms. Um, teams were not allowing you to come into their buildings and meet face to face. So everything was over zoom. And this year we slowly, but surely started getting back to face to face meetings. And you can imagine it's pretty, pretty uh, interesting to sit in a room with Bill Belichick or Tom Brady or Kyle Shanahan and, and listen to, you know, their greatness, decipher an opponent coming up or talk about their careers 
or discuss history. So I've got uh, just just to hold it up here. This is my notepad <laughs> from this year. So I've got all these pages of notes that I've taken in these meetings, starting with the Kansas City Chiefs week one at Arizona, our first meeting of the year with Andy Reid. They go on to win the Super Bowl. So you meet with these teams, you, you get inside information on the game, which you don't dispense of until the game broadcast itself. And then you do a three hour broadcast and it, it's uh, it's pretty intense, but you do the best you can. And I would say getting back to what we talked about a minute ago, distributing information, sharing concepts. If you have a hundred items going into a game, picking a hypothetical number, of course, you might only use 15 to 20 of those items on the air. So literally 80% of what you've accumulated, written down, have stored away in your brain somewhere, never even makes it to the air. But you always want to be over-prepared versus under-prepared. So I think our shows have a lot of energy. You know, Tony and Jim have, have a great partnership. They're, they're friends off the air as well as on the air. And that's something that evolves over time. It takes years and years to develop. But they had chemistry from day one. And remember, Tony had no broadcasting experience. So, um, you know, it's been a process to get him, you know, not a process, but it was, you know, there were a couple of years there where he was just getting up to speed. And once he figured it all out, it's been a joy to not only work with him, but have all of us working collectively as a team and hopefully putting out a good product every every weekend on CBS. Yeah, I love Jim Nance. I love Tony Romo. I, I, I love Tony just because he just was so great right from the beginning. He would come in and he'd just be like, oh, look at this formation. Look at this. This is what they're going to run. And he was right almost every single time. I mean, the guy, you know, he, he knows his stuff, no doubt about it, from being – an NFL quarterback, obviously. I mean, he's very smart. He's funny. Um, uh, Jim is just the, the voice. I mean, my God, the voice of the masters, right? I mean, that's, it's, uh, you, 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 I mean, come on, you say they're not the best, but they are the best. I mean, and, and like they, it's interesting. I, I guess with, with CBS, there was a time where CBS just got AFC games. Is that right? And then now it seems like yeah. they, get some NFC, AFC mix, or they get some pure NFC games too, right? Is that the yeah, way it's, it's happened exactly over time? It. It, it's an evolving situation. And just going back, if, if I if I didn't say we're the best, uh, I appreciate you you pointing that out because we I think we are the best, but you know, it's not a competition really. I mean you're just you're just trying to put the best product you can on the air. And then you don't really sit back and watch the other networks and, and say, and start nitpicking. Cause you understand like their job is tough. You know, the, the hardest thing to do in broadcasting Ted is do a game. For instance, on Christmas day this year, we, we, we did a game in Los Angeles, the Rams and the Broncos. It was a blowout and you're working on, you know, one of the most, if not the most important holiday of the year. And you're sitting there, you're away from your family and, and you've got a game that's not even really worth talking about, but yet you have to fill three hours on national television. That's where, where broadcast networks really or broadcast teams earn their, earn their stripes. But I think we do a great job because, you know, we're flexible. If the game's high intensity and comes down to a last second field goal, we cover that very well. If the game's a blowout, we're able to kind of shift gears and go into, you know, storytelling mode. If a game's, you know, uh, delayed by a, a huge injury that might take 10 minutes to resolve and, you know, and get a player. I mean, obviously the most glaring example and, and was a near tragedy and luckily has turned into a, an incredibly positive story is DeMar Hamlin and how ESPN had to handle that in real time. And that's almost unprecedented what they had to deal with. So for us, you know, it, it's just about storytelling. It's about energy. It's about, like you say, dissecting football and talking not to the high end, you know, NFL fan or, or a coach out there, because that's a small portion of your audience. And certainly you want to gear some of your commentary to the, the highest IQs watching. But but 85 to 90 percent of the audience, I would say, is casual. Um, so you have to understand you know, what works for that audience versus others. And to, to mention what you discussed earlier about Romo, our first game was in Tennessee in 2017. It was the Raiders at Tennessee. And Tony predicted like 10 consecutive plays on the air. And, and from that point forward, that's kind of what he got known for. I think the pinnacle broadcast for him in that regard 
was our uh, Patriots Kansas City AFC Championship game in 2018. Mahomes against Brady, overtime, um, and and Tony was just almost every play that New England ran in the fourth quarter and overtime. He saw it before it happened. And um, I think what happened there, Ted, eventually was he didn't want to be known only for predicting plays. You know, you want to show his full versatility. So he's cut back a little a little bit on that in the last couple of seasons, but he can always go back whenever he needs to. Tom, Tom, I said, bring it back. Bring it back. I love it. <laughs> it's a, no, I mean, I, either way, he's great. But, I mean, that was just the thing that just astounded me to see him just – rattle off those plays consecutively is amazing. Um, Tommy, I think people would love to hear a little more about, I mean, the last game you guys did together was the AFC championship game at Arrowhead, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess, you know, speaking of filling space, you should be probably pretty glad that you were AFC that weekend and not NFC because there was about 52 minutes worth of space to fill an NFC championship game between the Niners and Eagles. Once Brock Purdy went down, that game, we all, I mean, we, we held out hope that there might do something, but realistically, once Brock was out and not going to be able to come back and throw, uh, pretty much anyone uh, knew that, that there was no way we were going to beat the Eagles in that game. So it's like, I've heard it said that, you know, w the worst th thing about a football game is the time between when the game is over and when the game actually ends. And in the NFC Championship game, in my mind, it was pretty much over with 52 minutes to go, which is probably the most I've ever seen. Um, but I'd love to hear more about, uh, you know, Arrowhead, and especially that weekend was unique in that the way you guys covered the golf tournament on Saturday, I believe, mm -hmm. too, that was also in San Diego, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Well, thanks for mentioning that. Ted, yeah, it's been the last couple of years um, where the so what the PGA Tour decided to do two years ago was was finish the uh, Farmers Insurance Tournament at Torrey Pines on Saturday rather than Sunday where you're competing against both championship games. I thought it was a brilliant decision. You have a prime time finish on Saturday night. Now you do lose a little bit. Uh, you know, with the Sunday audience, because, you know, most golf fans, that's when they're used to watching the final round. But nevertheless, um, you know, we had two years ago, Will Zalatoris, who grew up in the Bay Area, with a great chance to win his first tournament. And it's, it's, I mean, around nine o'clock East Coast time. So there were a lot of people watching that show. But what the way we did it technically was that Jim would be at our production truck in Kansas city. Now it just so happens that the last two years, in fact, the last five years, we've done the AFC championship game in Kansas city at Arrowhead. So um, the third round was on Friday evening, Friday night, the, the final round Saturday. So both, both times we would go to the production trucks and they would have a studio set up inside where we would have the feed coming from San Diego headsets on Jim would be able to communicate in real time with our producer seller shy uh, at Torrey Pines as well as the other announcers and it's been uh, a pretty seamless show I mean there, there have been a couple technical things that you would never notice on the air that were um, uh, things that we had to overcome uh, ourselves but nevertheless I think the product was was amazing so it, the Basically, Jim's thought was, if I'm going to be watching the golf tournament anyway from my hotel room in Kansas City, I might as well broadcast it. So we did that. Um, went very well this year, as you mentioned. And then Sunday, we go to Arrowhead. And in, from my perspective, I couldn't wait to watch the Niners game. And so you've got about four hours before our broadcast. So I found myself a comfortable spot in Arrowhead and, and I was ready like you were to, to watch this great battle. I mean, win or lose, these look like the two best teams in the NFC and maybe all of football. So, um, you know, I, I'm thinking back through Niners history and you'll appreciate, I mean, the most significant quarterback injury in game is probably Joe Montana against the giants in 1990 going for three in a row, but that was late in the game. And they still had Steve Young, a future Hall of Fame quarterback, waiting in the wings. And, and really, other than a fumble there by Roger Craig, they probably win that game. And most likely, they defeat Buffalo. But, of course, you know, that, that's revisionist history. But like you say, this game was, was over. I mean, even though they fought so hard and McCaffrey had one of the great 
postseason touchdown runs that we've seen, you know, to make it a, a competitive game. You just never felt like over the, the time, over the, the full 60 minute spectrum that the Niners would be able to keep up. So pretty disappointing because, you know, I can think back to some championship game losses, obviously last year with the Rams, you know, you go back to as, as far back as 1983 at Washington, the Niners were down 21, nothing came back to tie it. And then the uh, the Redskins then, now Washington Commanders, you know, win the game 24-21. So there have been some – and then the Giants game I mentioned, which was at Candlestick, there have been some pretty tough losses in that game for this franchise. But this one was just so unusual because you felt like you never got to see the, the best product possible. But in the end, it, it probably helped me because I wasn't, like, going on to work the CBS broadcast thinking about how do we lose this game on a last-second field goal – um, which, you know, I, I'd like to think of myself as a professional and, and you kind of have to move away from being a fan. I mean, we, we did a 49ers Super Bowl against Baltimore down in New Orleans and you, you have to be impartial, even though you'd like to see, you know, the red and gold win the game. But uh, I think in this situation, it just allowed me to get refocused on my, my true job and occupation and, and worry about the Chiefs and the Bengals. And we'll, we'll hope that next year the Niners get another crack at it. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I agree. Obviously, the Niners, Eagles, best two teams in the NFC. Uh, I could you could say the most two complete teams in the NFL. It's just that the Bengals and Chiefs had better quarterbacks. Um, but the Chiefs were looking pretty complete in the Super Bowl, even with their eight rookies. Hats off to uh, uh, their uh, GM. I'm blanking on his name right now, but um, Chiefs have done a heck of a job yeah. building that that, Red that roster. Veach, that's right. Yes, exactly. So um, did you feel like in the NFC Championship game that the refs kind of turned against us once Brock Purdy went down? Like they just didn't want to see Josh Johnson, you know, in the Super Bowl against – it was either going to be Mahomes or or Burrow. We yeah. knew that much. Do, do, I, I are you? I'm, I'm kind of a I'm kind of a tinfoil hat guy, and I and I and I you know I I've, I always want to know people's opinions on the refs if they think there's bias, if they think they try to keep teams in in games to keep ratings high, you know, or they favor big quarterbacks. There's lots of different things, or if there's something political, or you know, there's like lots of different things you could say why refs might favor one team or the other. But I'm curious to know if you're a tinfoil hat guy like me, or if you feel like it's just Bad referees lead to bad calls. <laughs> well, um, I think even good referees can make bad calls. And and I think bad referees make good calls. You know, I, I mean, I, I've not spent 60 minutes down on the sideline of an NFL game, but I have been down there. And, and in real time, you know, the speed and the noise and the, and the frenetic nature, uh, you know, it's almost – like too much to ask. Um, and I think the referees do for the most part, an amazing job. Now the, the difference between, you know, 15 years ago and today is that you've got the eye in the sky, like literally, you know, if, if not to cover your mistakes, to actually identify calls that could have been made differently. And, and I would think psychologically you now. So for instance, I work with Gene Steratore at CBS. This is a man of incredibly high integrity and, you know, you can think of examples through the years, like, I know we still have a lot of Raider fans in the Bay Area. You, know, you think about the Immaculate Reception, which was uh, honored this year, Ted, 50 years later. And and you talk to the Raiders. And when I was at KNBR Radio, I did it. They say it hit the ground, right? Say again? They say it hit the ground, right? Franco Harris's catch. There, are, there is a school of thought that it hit the ground. There, there's the other school of thought that, you know, Jack Tatum didn't hit the ball first. It was hit by the left arm of Frenchie Fuqua, the wide receiver, which in 1972, you were not allowed to have offensive players cap, touch the ball consecutively. It had to be a defensive okay. player deflecting a ball that an offensive player caught in the air and ran for whatever gain. So that was the big argument for the Raiders. But but the one reason the referees apparently, and what I was going to say about KNBR was I did a, a radio documentary in 1999, which was the end of the, of the 20th century. So it was like a history of Bay Area sports. And I talked to a lot of ex-Raiders, including John Madden and Jack Tatum about the play. And you know, their, their overall theme was the referees had to make that decision that Pittsburgh – 
was going to have the touchdown allowed because they were worried for their own personal safety getting off the <laughs> field. So, you know, you have that psychological element where 70,000 people hate you. And if you make a call that goes against a home team or in favor of a visiting team, you know what the ramifications are. But but I, I didn't look at the, the 49er Eagles game as one where the refs, you know, got too involved. I mean, yes, there were a couple decisions. Clearly the, the catch by Devonta Smith, which was so bang, bang. You know, I'm not sure you could have seen that anyway with the naked eye. And then, you know, to the and Hafanga, Hafanga might have been blocking their vision too, right? Because he was right there next to Jimmy Ward as Jimmy Ward was bringing Devontae Smith to the ground. So maybe Hufanga obscured their vision too. Very possible. In the end, it took Fox like their fifth or sixth replay though, before they even found the angle that, that sort of showed the ball had hit the ground and oscillated. So if it took that many, you know, high speed cameras, how's, how's a referee, you know, who's trying to run down the field or is positioned in the end zone as a back judge or a line judge, or a side judge able to see that in real time. I guess I'm trying to say is that it's so hard to get those calls right. So I don't believe that referees make decisions based on seeing certain teams you know, advance, certain teams lose. I think just the nature of, of the, the job is so difficult. And the fact that you might be influenced by head coaches that are screaming at you, fans that are yelling and taunting, um, or just the speed and athleticism of the players on the field makes it a very, very difficult job. I don't know what the ultimate solution is. I think they do a pretty darn, you know, they make a pretty darn good effort as it is, but there's always going to be calls that go against teams. And I'll harken back to a game I referenced earlier, again, way, way back in the time machine, but 1983 against Washington, the 49ers were called for two defensive penalties on the last series of the game, one on Ronnie Lott for holding and one on Eric Wright for pass interference. And those were two calls that were very dubious at the time. So these things happen through time. And hopefully, you know, next year, if the 49ers are back in that game, they're getting a call or two that goes in their favor that maybe propels them to the Super Bowl. So 1983, <clears throat> that's the, you know, that's Doug Williams, right? The first black quarterback to ever win a Super Bowl then? Uh, I think it, it might have been Joe Theismann still, but Williams. Oh, Theismann, was that's right. Shortly Williams thereafter. Was later yeah, in the 80s. Exactly yeah. right, Ted. Okay. Doug Williams. <clears throat> All right. right. No, you're right. Okay. There, uh, in San Diego well, to win the Super Bowl. All right. Well, as a, as a Raider fan, you mm -hmm. must you must have been a little bit upset about um, the tuck rule with Tom Brady <laughs> against the Raiders. You know, it's funny. Um, at the time, and this is getting, you know, maybe a little little deeper than we need to, but that game, which was, you know, in January of 2002, um, on the heels of 9-11, and I, I think, like, you know, millions of people after 9-11, like, sports was not an afterthought, but it's like, I mean, do we really want to get too worked up about, you know, this and that? Um, now, the Yankees played in the World Series, you know, shortly after 9-11. It was an amazing scene. You know, President Bush threw out the first pitch. Yankees trying to win the World Series for New York. Uh, Arizona ultimately prevailed there. I mean, that was a, a sporting event that had true meaning beyond just, you know, between the lines and fandom. And so I kind of had the same, I guess, approach to the tuck rule game. I mean, it, it was bizarre when it happened. And I know the Raiders, you know, will probably never get over it. But, you know, professionally, in a weird way, it, it spawned for me um, in 2004. I, I started with the NFL coverage on CBS um, on the A crew. And from that point until Tom Brady just retired, Ted, um, our crew was involved in over 100 of his games. So, Amazing. I mean, that's a pretty big honor when you think that, you know, really it's Tom Brady and probably Joe Montana, one and one A in the all time ranks. And if I get the, if I get the, the sensation that I watched a lot of Joe Montana's games on television and in person growing up and covered a lot of Tom Brady's games throughout his entire career, I'm feeling pretty fortunate. So um, I guess the tuck rule spawned another dynasty in the NFL um, controversial play, no doubt. And I still don't understand why it was allowed, but I think at the time it was just a, like an amazing, like, What's going on here? It's snowing. You know, Raiders are trying to get back to the Super Bowl for the first time in a long time. 
and yet Brady prevailed, then wins the Super Bowl a few weeks later, and then you know the rest is history. So that's just another footnote in Raiders history, which is you know immaculate reception, sea of hands game with Clarence Davis. Um, you know, looking at um, the Holy Roller with Dave Casper. I mean, I could think yeah. of another 10 controversial plays one way or the other. The Raiders have just had more than their share throughout time. And the tuck rules probably going to be right up there at the top when you write the history of, of that franchise. No doubt about it. And as long, and then, you know, one last thing I'll just say about the refs is I bet you'd never catch Jim Nance or Tony Romo saying stuff like uh, Olsen did, um, uh, Greg Olson uh, for, for Fox, where he's saying, oh, mind of a center, mind of a center, when Lane Johnson kept false starting and they weren't calling it. Like, that drove me bananas because it happened versus us and it happened in the Super Bowl too. And maybe that's a good segue to talk about Super Bowl. Um, I mean, I guess a lot of people are upset about the Bradbury call at the end. I'd love to get your thoughts on that, or if you want mine first, however you'd like to go on that. I, I you know, I'd love to chat about that. So yeah, well, I, I guess it's hard for me, and and maybe because I'm covering the NFL now, Ted, and, and not watching it like you know I'd love to be doing on Sundays, just sitting at home and and following the league. But you're kind of working in that spectrum, so I try to take. Um, I call it a neutral approach and not get too passionate about it. I think it's a little unfortunate that the Super Bowl, you know, comes down to one play and one controversial play. I guess my mindset mentally at that time was that Kansas City was going to win the game. Like they were the better team in the second half. They were dominating. They were scoring on every possession. Now that's a what third and seven and Mahomes throws it up kind of for grabs and somewhat uncatchable, but is there a reason why it was uncatchable? Because, you know, Juju, uh, his progress was impeded, you know, twice. He was held. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Bradbury did admit that he held, I guess, you know, his, his only concern was, you know, he probably held three or four times prior in the game and they didn't call it. Why wait till then? I don't know. Um, it's, it, you know, we, we, well, I mean, or, or maybe it's like he held all those times and finally like, well, we're not gonna let you get away with it anymore. Right. I mean, that's the sort of way I looked at like, yeah, the Eagles got away with so much. That's why I wasn't that upset. Even if you don't think it should have been called there, I wasn't that upset with that one because it's like I saw at least one by Bradbury where I said, hey, he, he held or it was P.I. And then there was all those Lane Johnson false starts, just like in the NFC Championship game. I saw him in the Super Bowl, too. And, and Olsen was even saying, oh, heart, mind of a center or whatever his little way of, you know, glossing over it was. It was really frustrating. So, like, I was just sort of like, you know, I mean, yeah, the Chiefs were the better the better team, especially in the second half of that game. So to me, that one wasn't one where I was like blaming the refs. I was like, actually, the Eagles got away with a ton in that game, in my opinion, prior to that. So, yeah. and you also have to remember, in, in game, there's a lot of politicking going on. So, so we don't know that that Juju Smith Schuster wasn't going up to the referees throughout the game and complaining. We don't know that the Chiefs or Andy Reid, right? Sure thing. I mean, there you got to remember these refs are on the sideline, you know, getting an earful for 60 minutes. So at some point they might, you know, buy into that rationale. So, uh, you know, I think in general, the Super Bowl was very interesting. Um, Eagles dominate the first half. You know, you know, they can go back and look at, you know, two plays, a false start on a quarterback sneak, which was clearly the right call, but that quarterback yep. sneak goes through, you know, they're going to continue driving next play. Jalen Hurts fumbles, really the only bad play he probably made in the entire game, but it cost them, you know, it not only cost them a, a field goal or touchdown going one direction, you know, the, the Chiefs scoop and score going the other way. And then, you know, the Chiefs just made the adjustments. You know, they used that that long halftime. When, when you're at the Super Bowl, Ted, halftime feels forever. You know, normal game, it's like 10 minutes. You, you, you take your headset off, you go to the back of the booth, grab a, grab a burger, um, you know, maybe you check, check your phone, see if, if your wife called for any reason, have a quick conversation, and then you're right back on the air. But at the Super Bowl, you're sitting there. They're putting a stage on the field. There's a halftime performance. There's a lot. It's like 30 minutes of real time. So the Chiefs, knowing this, used it to their advantage, obviously brought out some plays that they hadn't used not only in the game but all season. 
and sprung it on the Eagles in the second half, and they were just the better team. So I felt like even if they'd had to kick a field goal, um, if the Bradbury penalty had not been called, that they were going to win the game. That will not appease, by the way, Eagles fans, who I occasionally tune in on sports radio here in Philadelphia, and there's a lot of venom still about the field being too slick, which I could have told you was going to be a problem because we did week one Kansas City at Arizona, and Harrison Butler right. took a divot about as long as you're set and, and ruined his <laughs> ankle for four games. The Chiefs knew that field was going to be a problem, and they made the adjustments and the Eagles did not. But the fans in Philadelphia are not going to get over that game anytime soon. Now, it definitely hurt their defensive ends. They weren't able to turn the corner and come after Mahomes the same way they would have been able to with better footing. Uh, that really neutralized one of the uh, big Eagles advantages in that game, I thought. Um, yeah, no, all really great stuff. Uh, you mentioned your wife, Lisa. So I got to give her a shout out for uh, helping put us together. I mean, uh, she she uh, has been watching my show a little bit and she said to me, she said, hey, Ted, how come you haven't had Tom on the show? <laughs> and, and, and I said, I just thought Tom was out of my league, Lisa. Oh, She's geez, like, come on. I, I think if you just ask, he would come on and here we are. So thank you, Lisa, for, um, for putting us together, for making this happen. Uh, amazing, uh, I'm indebted forever, for sure. And uh, also, she's also helped set up uh, someone else, too, who may be coming on the show before too long. I don't want to talk about it until it happens, but uh, uh, another another big name that uh, certainly would not be a normal TED Talks ball person, not just yet, maybe someday, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, anyway, so, so thank you to Lisa. Um, so what else? As far as um, uh, there was something I wanted to – oh. You've mentioned the sneak and the false start on the sneak. And there's been a lot of talk about these rugby scrum sneaks by the Eagles and potentially maybe even outline them. Do you think that, that they should outlaw this rugby scrum sneak? Yeah, good, good question. It's, it's changed the dynamic of the sneak. You know, like we were talking about Tom Brady earlier. And um, in a championship game we did in New England, I believe in 2011, Brady hurtled the line of scrimmage, Ted, and uh, on a, on a one-yard plunge, you know, a version of the quarterback sneak, except he jumped over his center. Well, the problem was Ray Lewis was coming in full speed and went right into his back. And uh, at the time, you know, nothing was really discussed, but Tom – you know, oftentimes we'll, we'll, we'll go back and revisit Super Bowl wins and losses with players and coaches the next season or seasons down the line. So, you know, Tom, I think, told us the next year that he really messed up his back on that play. And it impacted him in the Super Bowl against the New York Giants, the second Super Bowl they played. So I guess my point is, I mean, we are about preserving quarterback safety and health. Now, the Chiefs ironically, have barely run one quarterback sneak since Mahomes hurt himself in Denver years ago. They've basically given up on it. So what's their solution? They actually, several times this year in games we did, brought in a tight end to run the sneak instead of Mahomes. Mahomes would simply split out wide or not even be on the field. So there's a lot of variations. I admire the creativity of Nick Sirianni. I admire the creativity of Andy Reid. I don't know where you start and where you finish. Like, are you not allowed to have three offensive linemen in the backfield, you know, ineligible, eligible, pushing? That's that's you know? what it is. It's the push, right? I mean, yeah. I think Brady is great at sneaking. Jimmy G is great at sneaking. Kyle uh, uh, Shanahan obviously used, used check coming in motion and then starting in and taking the snap similar to what you're talking about yeah. to get somebody else besides the quarterback to do it. But it's these big heavies in the backfield pushing uh, on the rear end of, of the quarterback uh, that I think is what's got people, you know, when I saw it, I didn't like it when I saw it in the NFC championship game and in the Super Bowl, I tweeted out like, Hey, this is football, not rugby. Right. Isn't it? You know, and that type of thing. And so, mm -hmm. I don't know. I just was curious to know if you thought – because here's the thing. Here's my thing with it, right? It's a copycat league. If it works for the Eagles, other teams are going to start doing it. And you could get into this situation where 
it's third and five and you know teams and defenses are automatically going to bring in their nickel package to stop the pass in third and five and you know all of a sudden if you can do this rugby scrum sneak for two and a half yards per then you do it and then you do it you line up quickly you don't even have to huddle right and you can do it before they can change personnel and you do it again or you could even imagine if they're getting two and a half per, they could just do it four times in a row and you just go down the field doing this. And like, who wants to watch that, right? I mean, that's that's sort of the extreme version, but ultimately, I don't know. I, I would be in favor of banning it. I'll just say that. Yeah, and, and that'll be something that's discussed in the competition committee you know, meetings in the off season. Um, might take some creativity to figure out exactly how they're going to, you know, address it and you know, what's what's allowable and what isn't. And keep in mind, you know, Jalen Hurts alone is a big man. There were a couple of times in the Super Bowl where even after the the initial push was concluded, like he was still moving his legs and getting you know an extra half yard, extra yard. So, I mean, sometimes it's you know it's a combination, as you say. Now, do you want to put your quarterback in the scenario that you just painted, which is a very good one? You know, multiple times in a row running sneaks and the risk of injuries is clearly very high. I mean, we're not even sure if Jalen Hurts ever got to be 100% again after he got his shoulder injured in Chicago on a, on a quarterback run. So, I mean, that's the, that's the dilemma going forward. The 49ers, the ultimate example, this is a Super Bowl team this year. They simply, in the end, and they were always teetering on the edge from the moment Lance got hurt early in the season through Garoppolo and finally with Purdy and Johnson, it, they just ran out of quarterbacks and, you know, there are only so many great quarterbacks in the league and there are only so many good quarterbacks in the league. It is not as uh, much of a plethora as we would like. And the league needs to figure out ways to continue to protect them and yet g- give defenses a chance to inflict harm. Um, so if you're going to run a quarterback four straight times, I guess if I'm a defensive player, I'm going to figure out a way to get him off the field, but th- they're going to have to resolve that this season or, in the future. Yeah. I'm just curious. I wanted to hear your thoughts. So thanks on that, Tom. Um, so that's kind of a good segue to talk a little bit about Brock Purdy. He's got this, we think relatively completely torn UCL, or I guess they're hoping it's not completely torn so they can do this internal brace and a repair, or maybe a six month prognosis could be in between, could be a hybrid of the internal brace and a Tommy John, not a full Tommy John, which would be more like nine months or the full Tommy John UCL replacement surgery, which would be more like nine, uh, 12 to 18 months potentially. Um, but it was, we were really saddened to hear Tuesday night, uh, we were having a big blackout here and um, we were up at my folks' house. Uh, I was streaming from there and um, I had forgotten something at home and I had to drive down and I had the radio on and on 95.7 The Game. And all of a sudden they're talking about Purdy's surgery being delayed. And I'm like, what? How could that be? It's already been so long. Shouldn't the swelling have already gone down? It's funny. My dad had asked me, uh, like, why are they waiting so long to do this surgery? I said, I think they're waiting for the this, this, this swelling to go down. And sure enough, now it hasn't gone down enough. Uh, love to get your thoughts on Purdy and what that means for his season uh, and for the Niners. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I'm wishing everyone well in Northern California with the weather, um, top to bottom, right up and down the state. It's pretty bad. But um yeah, you know, the inflammation has clearly, um, you know, become an issue here, Ted. And, and it looks like, as you point out, you know, March is the, uh, the earliest time frame. And it, I would say it's a setback. You know, I mean, w- when your season ends, the clock starts ticking towards September and it can come around fast. It may seem like a long off season, but when you factor in, you know, OTAs and camp, and preseason, you know, you, you want to be healthy. First of all, you want to be healthy at the end of the previous season, just so you can feel good getting out of bed, you know, maybe starting after two weeks when you, you begin your, your process to train for the upcoming campaign. Then there's the whole thing. So getting back to Kansas City briefly here, um, they revamped their whole wide receiver core after last season. They lost um, from the 2021 team almost 180 catches and 16 touchdowns, most notably Tyreek Hill. So what do they do? They go out and they find all these new wide receivers in free agency. They made a trade in season for Tony. But Mahomes spent a good part of his offseason inviting these guys down to Texas and throwing the ball and learning the Kansas City offense and learning each other. 
So what happens with the 49ers? Who do Debo Samuel and Ayuk and Kittle and Jennings and, and the full wide receivers, even McCaffrey, like who do they throw with in the offseason if, if their starting quarterback, if you believe Purdy is that man, can't throw – or if Trey Lance isn't ready to do so yet. So it kind of puts you behind the eight ball already. Um, we're hopeful. I guess, you know, I'm looking at the whole NFC West, Ted, and it's kind of ironic. Kyler Murray's not coming back until at least midseason, right? We don't know how healthy Matt Stafford is with his elbow. You know, he had to basically shut it down early this year. Obviously, Geno Smith made it through the season, had a big banner year in Seattle, but there's still questions about what's the long-term future with Smith in Seattle or who's the quarterback there. So if you're the 49ers, I think the one thing you have going for you is patience. It's not going to be how this team looks in September. It's how they're playing around Thanksgiving and December. And if it means that, you know, the Purdy uh, Lance dynamic is still being resolved mid season, which isn't ideal. Okay. I'll grant you that, but that's a, that's a, a positive situation that they can, you know, their, their division is down. So if they can get, you know, one healthy quarterback and a good backup, maybe in the draft or probably more likely free agency, low level, you know, third string quarterback and, and start the year with, you know, a Lance combination with, I don't know, I saw someone write uh, Trey Mullins coming back or something along those lines, then they can wait for Purdy to fully heal up and see how things go from there. I guess my bottom line in the end, more healthy quarterbacks, are good and the more talent you have at that position the better off you are granted egos get hurt and players have to sit out that don't feel like they deserve it but i think the niners long term are in pretty good shape at that position as long as they get these two guys healthy and back on the field yeah no doubt about it just hoping purdy can be back by week one or somewhere around there i do have a lot of faith in lance i think a lot of the people trying to compare lance and purdy are missing some key components that Lance never played with CMC, and we know what an amazing difference maker he is. Uh, Lance barely played with Kittle, so um, you know. And, and when he did play with Kittle, he won. When the when when the team played well, Lance won. When the team was struggling, you know, they struggled before Lance lost and after he lost both years. You mentioned slow starts. We're we're pros at that, right? Three <laughs> yeah. and five in 2021, three and four in in 2022. So, and a lot of that I think stems from so many of our coaches being purged every year. I think mm -hmm. we lost 11 coaches in 2021 and eight coaches in 2022. I think we're up to five or six already here in 2023. So uh, that's part of it. Uh, but I do have a lot of faith in Lance. I think that he will do well, um, I, maybe not right away, maybe not week one. But uh, if given the chance, I do think that he can end up as our QB one long term. But where that is, you know, depends. I think it's a great opportunity for him to really show us what he can do that he clearly wouldn't have gotten if Purdy was healthy. Healthy Purdy, there's almost no way Lance can win the job before week one because no matter what Lance does in preseason, it's not six and zero oh in the you know regular season and two and zero oh in the postseason. I mean, Purdy never lost except for when he didn't finish the game for us. So yeah. Uh, he's pretty amazing what he's done. I just think that there's way more chance of Lance learning to do what Purdy does than Purdy learning to be 6'4 and grow a cannon of an arm. Right? Well, you make and some so, great points there, Ted. And actually, I, I, I get optimistic the way you phrase that because, let's face it, Lance is going to need every snap he can get this offseason just to make up for what he lost in 2022. And I, and I don't want to also diminish um, – you know, getting off to a good start because in the end, you know, a large reason why the 49ers, you know, the injury obviously caused them to lose the game, but the bottom but, line is they had to travel to Philadelphia and they couldn't make up for the, even with all the wins, they still had to play that, that meaningful game on the road. You'd rather have it at home. One thing I'll bring up as well uh, that, that 49er fans are probably pretty fired up about, in the fact that they've lost two defensive coordinators here in the last three years who are, you know, brilliant coaches in Robert Sala and, and Ryan's D'Amico Ryan's is that, you know, we've, we've been around Steve Wilkes a little bit through the years. Um, most recently, the last time we spoke to him was when he was in Cleveland um, about three seasons ago. And he is big on speed at the defensive line position. He loves having the D line, be the strength of his defense. Now the 49ers have strength at all three levels and are pretty 
pretty balanced there. But I would suspect that the that um, in this draft or in this off season that they you know add to that nucleus, you know, find someone that can complement Bosa even better. That healthy unit, you know, he likes athleticism. You might remember a player for Carolina that that uh, competed with him, Shaq Thompson. You know, he was a three down linebacker in, in the same vein as Fred Warner. Doesn't come off the field, covers, plays the run well. So I think one reason that Steve Wilkes is here is that his coaching philosophy meshes very well with the athletes that the Niners have on D. And secondly, he knows the NFC West very well from his time in Arizona. So this is a positive, and I think the, the Niner defense, once again, like it did this year, can still be a strong component that can um, allow the offense to evolve and get up to speed as the quarterback position gets resolved. Nice. I love that. Uh, I just started flying that banner about the whole D'Amico Ryan, Steve Wilkes. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about Steve Wilkes for a lot of different reasons. Uh, there was a lot of talk about Fangio coming here, and I wasn't wild about him. One, he is about 20 years older. Two, he runs a 3-4, and I really don't want Bosa in a 3-4 where he's going to end up having to cover people in space. Right. Just, he's, I want him hand in the dirt, chasing quarterbacks or stuffing running backs, I think is the way he adds the most value. But Wilkes, I love what he did for the Panthers where he came in. You know, We beat them, and then they fired Matt Rule that next week. Their, their former head coach. Mm -hmm. Wilkes came in as the interim head coach. He got them winning. He got them, you know, I think if they had a real QB, they they could have won the NFC South. Uh, they came darn close to doing it anyway. And uh, and I just love that, that you know, the players, they were kind of heartbroken when they are a lot of them, not all, but a lot of them were heartbroken about Frank Reich being brought in. A lot of them wanted Steve Wilkes to stay on a, as the full-time head coach. So I think that bodes really well. And then just the fact that he has uh, you know a, a long history of being a good DB coach. So we've got Kosarek for the D-line, Johnny Hollins for the linebackers, and then Wilkes presumably will help the DBs. It's cool to hear that he likes fast uh, defensive linemen because we need a speed rusher to go on the other side of Bosa. We've needed one since D Ford. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, and maybe Drake Jackson can be that guy. I just don't think he's fast enough. I, I love Drake Jackson. I think he'll be a lot better next season with the full season of, uh, you know, conditioning, get them ready for that difference between sort of like the 10, you know, game season in the college versus us playing usually 20 games a season <laughs> for the Niners going with our deep playoff runs. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy about, I'm happy about Wilkes. Um, and, and I think a lot of people are, so that, that's pretty cool. And then I'm happy Kosurik stayed. I'm happy we got Clint Kubiak uh, now mm -hmm. to go with Clay Kubiak. I was saying all your Kubiaks belong to us now <laughs> uh, because, yeah. um, you know, and just all that whole synergy of the Gary and Mike and, you know, Gary Kubiak, Mike Shanahan. And then Gary was the head coach of the Texans when, when Kyle got his first start uh, being an assistant there. And, and just all the, the, those two families, the Kubiaks and the Shanahan's as well as the McCaffrey's, there's just so much, great synergy and brain trust and smart guys and also running similar systems, if not the exact same, very similar systems or systems that were merged to make the Kyle Shanahan system. So a lot to like, I mean, Kyle does a great job of hiring assistants. There's no doubt about that. The one, one that worries me a little bit this year uh, is uh, Rand Carthon though, going to the, the Tennessee mm. Titans. Yeah. That's a big loss. Uh, you know, the, the Niners have just, I mean, they've put a lot of talented coaches, um, you know, on display here in the last four or five years. And, and as we see, you know, this happened in New England, you know, the, the, the teams that are struggling are going to pick from the very best. And uh, I mentioned New England. I was going to point out just to give, you know, Kyle Shanahan a nod. You know, obviously his father, you know, has an impeccable resume you know, going back to his days with the 49ers in the early 90s and then coaching Denver to multiple Super Bowls, et cetera. Um, we met with we did the 49ers New England game in 2020. You may recall uh, the Niners went back to New England and put on a, a heck of a show against Belichick. And, you know, we met with Bill before that game and he was so he just could not stop talking about how tough Kyle's offenses are and were to stop and the, the the motions the zone reads 
you know, making play action, you know, making a, 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 the play action concept look like a run, but it's actually a pass, you know, and he just says the intelligence that, that Bill feels that both Kyle and even Sean McVay, he is so optimistic about both those young head coaches. So, you know, they're both in the same division, maybe unfortunately for 49er fans, but just so uh, your, your viewers understand that even the most you know, dominant head coach of all time has the highest amount of respect for Kyle. And, you know, the one stat I heard this year and Ted, if, if you know it, you know, tell me if I'm right or wrong, but I think Kyle actually said it is that every team that played the 49ers on their schedule this year lost the following week, which of course would also include the Eagles in the end in the Super Bowl. That's a pretty telling argument that your team is competitive and takes a lot out of their opponents win or lose. Yeah, the only ones who didn't were uh, the Chiefs because they had a bye, uh, so they didn't play the next week, and the Cards Week 18 because they didn't play in the playoffs, but they fired their head coach the week after we swept them. <laughs> That's true. Uh, and, and as far as the Rams go, you know, uh, I'm not that worried about the Rams right now just because, um, you know, we swept them before four years in a row. Uh, so yeah. they got us in the NFC championship game. So we're eight and one against them in the last nine games. And this Bobby Wagner uh, being released is huge. They only saved $5 million and he was PFF's top rated middle linebacker this season. He's not the best middle linebacker, but he's very good and, well, and not yeah. somebody you would just cut over $5 million. Um, so it's because he wants to play for a contender and he doesn't think the Rams are. And I think this is the first domino in a chain. I think they're going to trade Ramsey. I think I think it's rebuild time for them. I, I just I don't think I think they they went all in. They got their ring, mm -hmm. but a, a lot of times you go all in, you bust, or you get your ring, and now they're busting anyway. So I think we'll see. But uh, I'm not particularly worried. But McVeigh is very bright. He's definitely learned more how to use the uh, single back and two tight end sets more than Kyle. While Kyle loves his 21 personnel with you know, uh, a back juice Kittle and two receivers uh, tends to be our bread and butter formation. And now we've got all these positionless people where you can put Christian McCaffrey out wide or juice out wide or Kittle coming across in a motion to block or, you know, I mean, basically everybody except for IU plays multiple positions in that in the, of those five skill players. So uh, it's pretty incredible. Even IU does some jet sweeps and reverses. So um so uh we're coming up on an hour here tom um i i know you have things you need to do i just wanted to make sure we kind of covered i think we covered most everything honestly unless i would be curious to know where you think jimmy g will end up mm. boy that's a good one you know um i was listening to someone talking about aaron Rodgers and uh this individual was talking about you know, where he's going to end up, which might impact where Garoppolo goes. I actually have a theory, Ted, and, and this is just, you know, if, if we were on sports talk radio, this would fit in very, very well. You know, the hypothetical trade caller, you know, we've all listened to those through the years, 99.9% .9 of them never materialized. But if I told right. you that the Packers were going to trade uh, a quarterback to the Raiders and it wasn't Aaron Rodgers, but it was rather Ooh, Jordan Love. Jordan Love. And the reason I say that, you know, if you're Rodgers, do you really want to go somewhere else and start over? It, let's assume he wants to keep playing. All right. That's one right. assumption. And Aaron's, you know, always very coy about these things. But I, I can guarantee you he does not want to retire with the lone Super Bowl title. So, I mean, now is Green Bay ready to win a Super Bowl next year? That's a whole nother discussion. Let's say hypothetically Rodgers does stay and Jordan Love doesn't want to sit on the bench for another year. And the Raiders are building their entire team around Devontae Adams and his skill set. Um, you know, he knows Jordan Love. So I'll just throw that one out there as a possibility, a very slight one, to say the least. Where does Garoppolo end up? I think he ends up on a team that – simply needs a good to above average quarterback with a you know a very good skill set that will take them to the next level like you know you don't bring jimmy g into say chicago and say all right let's you know we're jettisoning just justin fields which might happen by the way anyway if they decide to use the number one pick in the draft uh, on bryce young but let's just say you know you're going to a team like the bears that are retooling you know, Jimmy G is probably not your answer, but a, a team that you know, looks pretty good, like New Orleans, 
you know, that has a good defense. I mean, you know, what's happening with Michael Thomas, who knows, but like has some skill set on offense already. Um, I guess that's kind of how I looked at the large, you know, viewpoint. The draft is going to dictate a lot. I mean, it's going to be a wild year. I mean, quarterback rotation, as you know, Ted, is like, I mean, that's that's where the league just thrives these days. I mean, you could see, what, 10, 12, you know, different starting quarterbacks next season that weren't in the same position at the end of last season. You know, it's just a such a volatile position. Everyone's still looking for that magic formula, which is what harkens back to my original point about the 49ers. Two is better than one. So you keep these two around, let them compete when they're both healthy for the job, best man wins. And it was another reason why it made sense to keep Garoppolo around, even though the way they got there was, you know, a very unique way to do it. But I just think I've seen too many situations where the starting quarterback gets hurt. I mean, if Mahomes isn't the toughest guy, you know, at that position and he's out and Chad Henney's trying to win you a Super Bowl, who, by the way, is a very good backup quarterback, just now retired, you're not going to win that game or win any games in the playoffs unless Mahomes comes back. So you got to be tough, you got to be durable, and you got to be talented. And there's only a handful of those guys that even exist. No doubt about it. And one that I've been thrown out there uh, is the Raiders, just because they've got the great weapons. They've got Josh McDaniels, mm -hmm. who coached Jimmy when they were in uh, the Patriots back in New yeah. England together. Yeah, uh, And then I guess New England is another one. You know, Belichick's always seemed to like um, – uh, Jimmy and and they don't him. seem too enamored with Mac Jones and I can yeah. see why I'm not a big Mac Jones fan myself either from his play but also just his attitude the guy just seems like kind of a repugnant type person honestly uh, with, <laughs> well, with the dirty plays and, and the fit <laughs> he's he is uh, not one of my faves just to say the least and I guess one other quick thing that I wanted to talk to you about was um, free agents from the Niners for the Raiders um obviously uh the, the Niners have a lot of free agents um we have uh, McGlinchey who I think is gone Brendel our center uh McGlinchey right tackle probably gone Brendel center may be gone I'm hoping we can keep Brunskill who's our sort of utility sixth man on the O-line he can kind of fill in anywhere but I worry that he might have priced himself out by platooning with Burford and then filling in for Aaron Banks so well when Aaron Banks was missed a few games towards the end of the season. And then on defense, we have like Emmanuel Mosley, uh, who did his ACL. Mm -hmm. um, Aziz Alshire, I think, is gone. Uh, I think Jimmy Ward is gone. Gibson, it sounds like if he doesn't retire, he'll be back. I really hope Gibson is back. He, he was so great for us this year. And then basically the whole D-line, other than <laughs> Bosa and Eric Armstead, are all free agents. Uh, and then Robbie Gold, I guess, are a few for the Niners. Yeah. I'd love to get your thoughts on them. Well, they're all important. Um, you know, you start just the last name you mentioned, you know, the kicker. And, and I see a lot of missed kicks around the league. You almost see more missed PATs than field goals now. It's amazing, the psychological element. And Robbie, as we know. Is, you Brett know, Maher. There's a great example. I mean, there's a guy that Ted had um, three kicks over 60 yards. We did a game this year in Minnesota where, where – Mar essentially won the game. The Cowboys dominated the game in the end, but he was so good and so accurate from long distances that they were just scoring on every possession. And now they're kicking indoors and all that. So it just shows you how fragile that position is. And Robbie Gold, you know, has just been a model of consistency throughout his career and most importantly in the postseason. Um, you know, I, I guess my, my first – response would be you know you can make up for a lot of losses in the draft now the 49ers have, have clearly given up a lot of capital there but you know even lower level picks as, as we've shown i mean sixth and seventh rounders and and you know even mr irrelevant can turn into starters very quickly um look at isaiah pacheco for kansas city you know wasn't drafted too far ahead of of uh, purdy this year and what a, a force he became for the chiefs and I use the Chiefs as an example, and it's an easy thing to do because they're winning Super Bowls. They're the most dominant, consistent franchise over the last five years. But they retooled half their roster. You know, when you look at them contractually, they signed Mahomes, they signed Kelsey, and they signed Chris Jones to long-term deals. But basically everybody else, with a few exceptions, Justin they're on one-, yeah. two-, three-year deals. 
You yeah. know, they're almost viewed as inter interchangeable in a way. And I'm not saying that's what the 49er philosophy is, but when you have good coaching and dominant elite players at running back, wide receiver, tight end, left tackle, middle linebacker, safety, outside edge rusher, you can kind of fill in the blanks at other positions that maybe aren't as important with, you know, lower price free agents and high level, uh, high round draft picks. So I think John Lynch and Kyle Shanahan have a plan. You know, Steve Wilkes has a pretty good, you know, track record of, of being involved in the drafts at various teams. You know, he's a, he's a middle-aged coach who's been around the block. I think their personnel department is excellent. The Niners are going to get this right. They just want to make sure that they, you know, they complement their elite players now in this window that they have to be dominant and not, you know, not get, you know, sort of back in the pack where you've got to fight your way back to the elite level. And I think they'll, they'll do a great job of that this offseason. Yeah, I've been saying I wouldn't be shocked if Kyle kind of takes a page out of Sean McVay's book or, you know, uh, Les Sneed, however you want to call it, and, and Lynch, um, of going all in. I, I, I know we've built responsibly for a long time, but I think Kyle might be getting a little tired of coming up short, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't be surprised to see us go all in, and if not this year, maybe in the next couple years while this core is still young and really just take a really big shot with, yeah. a, you know, that was maybe the pull some draft trade, picks right? up, was, was go big and free. going free. all in? Yeah, well, McCaffrey kind of, but, you know, with McCaffrey, he's under contract through 2025, so – He's not just a, a rental by any stretch of the means. We got yeah, him for three more seasons. Yeah, yeah. So that's cool. But, you know, I don't know. I'd be, I wouldn't be shocked. And then I guess one other thing I wanted to bring up was like, uh, you know, ra some Raiders free agents. Uh, there's one in particular that, that I was looking at that interests me, and that's Cleland Farrell, because you know, he was picked right after Bosa, obviously a bust based on his draft position. But, you know, he's, I've heard he started to play a little bit better recently, and he just seems like a perfect reclamation project candidate for Chris Kosarek, where he takes these guys who are drafted high. For whatever reason, they didn't quite work out. They come, they work with, with Kosarek on RD line, and all of a sudden, like Arden Key last year was a great example, also a former yeah. runner. Um, and so I, I was, I've just been saying I think that might be somebody the Niners might go after. I still think we need that quintessential speed rush defensive end, the D Ford replacement, if you will. But I, I would love to get Clue and Farrell in there on that rotation because we're, we got a lot of rotational guys that may not come back with uh, Hyder, Amenahu, Abicom, Willis. Uh, so th there's uh, at least four defensive ends that uh, we may lose uh, in free agency. Well, I, I can't speak uh, as an expert, and I'm not an expert on anything, but uh, in, in terms of, you know, Farrell's career, because we have just not done a lot of Raider games. But I do know this, you know, he's played special teams for them and apparently done so without making a big fuss. You know, when you're a top five pick and you find yourself playing the majority of special teams, a lot of guys would, would lose their minds and, and really not even show up for work. So, he appears to have a great approach to the game. And this is not a, a great correlation, Ted, and it just comes to mind as you were speaking there. You know, Trey Hendrickson was a, was a very good pass rusher in New Orleans. You know, he goes opposite Cam Jordan. But he signs with, with Cincinnati, and he's now working under Lou Anaruma, who's an outstanding defensive coordinator. And, and now he's – and again, it's not a correlation to Farrell, but he's he's the dominant player on that D line. He gets a change of scenery, gets a new contract, you know, a fresh approach. He's the man. So Farrell would clearly, if he were to come to the 49ers, would not be the man, but he would be a role player. But you give guys a change of scenery, a new contract, a new lease on life, you know, with incentives and, and just and you get around a different vibe. And I'm not saying the Raiders can't capture the 49ers vibe, but they're a year away from having that, that feeling. That's what Dave Ziegler and Josh McDaniels are trying to do. This literally reboot the franchise, get them organized. That's the one thing I thought and still think McDaniels will bring to the Raiders is a sense of organization and structure. That's like, you know, um, mistake proof in a way the Raiders, even in their heyday in the seventies and eighties, you know, were leading the league in penalties 
Um, I, I think they're going to play cleaner football, better football going forward. And so even if a guy like Cleveland Farrell is not a part of it, you know, he's the kind of guy you want on your team who will do a lot of the dirty work and get better with better coaching and better talent around him. So we'll see how that pans out. I love that. Sounds like he's got a good attitude uh, and would probably be a good culture fit. And that's so huge for the 49ers. Uh, don't ever want to see any bad apples brought in, no matter how talented they are. Uh, one last thing, Tommy, I'd love to get your opinion on. I don't know if you saw, but uh, Kyle was down in Cabo, as he always is in the offseason. <laughs> and some of the some of the sort of uh, key players for the 49ers uh, came down to join them. Debo, Kittle, Trent Williams, Christian McCaffrey. And uh, there may have been a few more, uh, but those are some of the big ones. Um, and so some people were kind of calling it uh, uh, the Cabo click and they were kind of being derogatory about it, like saying, oh, well, Kyle's only, you know, it's kind of bro or, or fr frat boy way of doing things and favoritism. And if you're team building, you use, you bring the whole team. You don't just bring the top players type of thing. And I kind of countered it and I said, it called it the Cabo core because these are the core players and they've kind of earned it. And, and down there, and I'm just curious if you had to take one way or the other on that, like what you th what you think about Kyle and bringing those top guys down to Cabo with him. I don't, we don't even know that Kyle brought him down. They may have planned it on their own and just met up with Kyle down there. That's right. the other part too, is we yeah. don't even know how it all came together. We just saw some pictures. Debo posted about it on his Instagram, and all of a sudden it just went wild as things do in the off season, right? So. Yeah, I mean, things can definitely uh, take on a life of their own these days uh, that maybe weren't meant to or, or uh, you know, it's sort of out of your control one way or the other. I, I guess I would I, I, I wasn't totally aware of it, but I would say this sounds like his leadership council. And this is a group of players. Now, one thing, you know, that really didn't get discussed a whole lot this season, but pretty remarkable how, you know, things were a year ago with Debo Samuel. And yet here he was back again this year. Now, granted, he did get hurt and was banged up there for you know a chunk of the second half of the year. But nevertheless, having Debo back and playing at 110 percent and, and you know his dynamic skill set. I mean, that's that was a win for the 49ers that they did not let him go, even though all signs pointed in that direction. So now that he's going down to Cabo with his teammates and hanging out with his head coach is nothing but a positive in my mind. You know, it's, it's not a, a perfect comparison, but, you know, when the, not, when the Warriors were recruiting Kevin Durant, you know, and flying back to the Hamptons, you know, there was Hamptons a certain five. Reason, you know, that certain guys were there. And so these are the, these are your leadership. These are your superstars and, and the guys that you, you rely on for counsel. And, and, and it makes sense to me to get together away from the football facility in Santa Clara and spend time, you know, one on one, but more importantly, as a group. You can only fly around to so many cities in the off season as a head coach, or have so many Zoom calls and cell phone calls. How much? How better? How much better is it than having dinner three or four nights in a row, or whatever they did, and really hashing things out? So, I applaud the Niners for doing those kind of things. That's what that's what good and great teams do. They find creative ways to keep their best players happy, and that's what San Francisco is trying to do here. Yeah, a few good tequila shots to ease their pain, right? <laughs> Never. <hurts. laughs> Why not? Never hurts. Why not? Why not? Cool. Well, Tom, I think that's really most of the uh, of the things that I wanted to go over with you. I know we're a little bit over on time here too, so I don't want to keep you too much longer. But uh, was there anything else that you wanted to bring up that you've been meaning that I missed that you, you got any burning desires, anything like that? <laughs> no, Ted. Other than to say, I'm, I'm proud of you. I've I've had a chance to read you know some of your material. I know that you've uh, this has been a passion of yours for a long time, and I hope your audience is enjoying you know all your your knowledge. And I wish you nothing but success with this uh, endeavor going forward and uh, happy to come on, you know, in the future. But uh, I just wish you well and, and I'm proud of you. Well, I mean, you, thanks for the well wishes. But I mean, coming on the show is what really does it. Having, you know, I, I just tell people, people are like, oh, you're doing so great. You're doing so great. I'm like, no, I just have great guests. That's mm -hmm. the whole trick to this whole thing. If you have great guests on, everything is easy from there. It's just a conversation. Just have some fun learn a few things from each other and, you know, hopefully pass along some knowledge to the, to the audience. And, 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 and uh, like I said, have a good time and learn and teach. That's all I'm all about. And uh, I appreciate you coming on and teaching me a few things. And, you know, I, as well as I know you, there's a lot of things that I learned today too. So I'm sure the audience will be really excited to find out all these things. 
And uh, we'll have to do it again sometime when you're not too busy. Come back for a follow up, maybe before the season gets started, if you're if you've got some time then. But uh, you're always welcome to come back and uh, you know, tell Jim and Tony that uh, Ted said hi, even though they don't know me. <laughs> but uh, yeah. we'll, we'll get, we'll get uh, another game next year. Uh, hopefully, when the schedule comes out, we'll we'll introduce you to the to the boys. So I appreciate hey, that, having you on. Good luck with everything. That'd be incredible. Well, thanks a lot, Tommy. And uh, I'll just say uh, peace and uh, go Niners. Thanks, Ted.